Hello friends, good morning and welcome to College Road. My name is Jason. Thank you so much for joining us this morning for online worship. Hey, just a quick reminder for you, don't forget, coming up on September 19th, we have Back to Church Sunday. And not only do we want to see you come back to church, but we want you to invite someone to come with you. And here's why. Hope is here. It's your church joining together with thousands of other churches across the nation to reignite togetherness, re-engage our communities, and reach people with the hope of Jesus. Back to Church Sunday has been celebrated every fall for the past 12 years. It is a movement of Christ followers reaching every neighborhood to invite every person to a Bible-believing church where they can discover true community. But this year, after world-changing events have affected us all, something new is happening. It's time for the church to bring us together again in an unprecedented way. This is Hope's Comeback. Millions of people invited to a church near them. And on September 19th, more people than ever before on one day will be introduced to Jesus, experience his hope, and connect with others. It's time to love again, serve again, and hope again. Well, good morning and welcome to College Road. We're so thankful that you're here to worship with us today. And uh, let's just join together and worship the one uh, that makes all this possible, Jesus.
how true that is. Our only defense, our only hope is in Christ alone. We put our trust in him for all that we are in the future, which is after this life. We've also put our trust in him for these days that we're living and walking through. And he's been trustworthy. He has taken us through everything we need. He has been there near to us, beside us, with us, in us, and through us. And we're just here to give him praise and honor and glory. And as we think about participating through online worship or participating through online giving uh, or, or mailing in offerings, as we think about the other ministries that we can be involved in by encouraging people and calling people and reaching out to people and sending notes to people. We want to be his hands and feet as we continue to walk through these times together, bringing him glory and honor because he's, he's provided it all for us. He shed his blood. He took away our guilt. He took away uh, all of our sin. And we can now be free, not only free, but free indeed. So would you join me in prayer as we dedicate ourselves, our gifts, our offerings unto him. Father, thanks so much for being everything to us that we need. We do need you. We confess that. We affirm that. Apart from you, we're just not able to do anything useful. We're praying that you might fill each of us with your Holy Spirit so that we might do the work of ministry even in more difficult times than it used to be. We pray for our missionaries. We pray for those who are serving all over the world. Ask your care, guidance, and strength and anointing on their lives and ministries. And we pray for our church and we ask your blessings on it. And I pray for those who are watching at home that for whatever reason can't be in the gathering place, that they'd know that they are a part of us and we are a part of them. And we pray your blessings on their lives as they sing with us and listen to our pastor as he opens the word of God. Thank you for what you have done, what you're going to do. Thank you especially for what Jesus did for us on the cross and its daily and yet eternal benefit. You are a great God. In his name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Sing with us as we are mindful of the great sacrifice of our Lord and Savior, Jesus. There's a place where mercy reigns and never dies There's a place where streams of grace flow deep and wide Where all the love I've ever found comes like a flood comes flowing
happy Labor Day weekend. Welcome to uh, College Road. And if you have a copy of God's Word, if you would turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to continue our Better Together series this morning as we think about the fact that not only uh, has God saved us, but he has saved us into a family. And he saved us for a particular purpose, for his glory, for his mission, for his kingdom, and to build his church. Uh, a few years ago, Lexus uh, kept running a commercial that used two crash test dummies in a, the driver's seat and the passenger seat of uh, a car. The engineers were going to crash the car into a wall in order to show how safe the car was. But one of the things that was always interesting to me as I watched that commercial was the fact that the dummies were all dressed like humans. Now, they weren't humans. They weren't alive. Uh, but they were dressed in suits and ties. And one of the dummies had a, uh, a hat on. And the other dummy had his hand on the wheel uh, sporting a, what looked like an expensive watch. They were well-dressed, good-looking dummies headed to a brick wall. I mean, they, they looked good, but they weren't alive. Everybody knew that. That was kind of the point. They're, they're not alive, but they give lots of different statistics and lots of different data to the engineers to see how safe the car was. But these lifeless dummies, well-dressed, were headed for disaster. You know, when we get in our cars today and we leave church or we're leaving to go to the grocery store or we're going to head out uh, and go to the lake or to the beach or whatever we're going to do for this Labor Day weekend, all of our church family headed in different directions. We will sit in the seats of our cars. We will be dressed for wh wherever we're going, for whatever we're going to be doing. And the question will be whether or not we will be filled with life or filled with death. Now, that may not be the question on our mind, but it is the most important question that will be asked of any of us at any point in our life. Will we be headed for an eternity with God in the heavenly places, or will we be headed for an eternity filled with disaster? You know, it's possible to look great, it's possible to feel great, and it's possible to still be lifeless. Many people are walking around today spiritually dead. And unfortunately for lots of us, we don't even know it. Look what the Apostle Paul says in verse 1. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. And were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. In this passage, Paul introduces a word that a lot of Christians use uh, kind of flippantly. As a matter of fact, we use it so much, it's kind of shorthand to summarize our relationship with Jesus. It, it is really a word that probably confuses a lot of outsiders, a lot of unbelievers, a lot of the world. And sometimes it even scares them because they're not really sure what we're talking about. And that word is the word saved. There probably, though, is no better word that summarizes what happens to us when we meet and surrender our life to Jesus. In fact, one of the reasons it confuses people is because it actually encapsulates the helpless state that Jesus had to rescue us from. What is it that you need to be saved from? That's part of the confusion in the world. That's where Paul starts his explanation of the gospel. What's true about us that made Jesus' rescue operation necessary? What do you mean saved? I'm fine. I'm alive. There's no... There's nothing I need to be saved from. But here's where Paul starts his discussion of the gospel because here's what we need 
to know. You need to understand your position before Christ. If you don't understand where you came from, you won't understand what he saved you from, or for some of you, what you need to be saved from. That's why he says there in verse 1, and you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. Here as we begin this passage of scripture, Paul dispels two very deeply ingrained myths about evil in this world. The first one is this, the main problem in the world is other people. That's the first myth. Everybody recognizes that our world is filled with pain and suffering and evil. We assume, however, that other people are the primary problem. These people have done these things and therefore it's caused issues and suffering for us. We put locks on our doors, we put filters on our internet in order to keep evil out of our lives. Or we think that everybody that's unlike us is the main problem with the world. In a very harsh political landscape, we see it all the time. Conservatives think liberals are the problem. Liberals are destroying family values. They're undercutting the backbone of our society. They're trying to remove gluten from all of our food supply. And yet on the other side, liberals think that conservatives are the problem. They are prideful. They are bigoted. They don't recycle. There are so many things that keep us divided, and we always like to point the blame at other people. But the second myth, that Paul dispels here is also this. Deep down, we are really not that bad. Everybody else is bad, but, but by and large, most people that are like us are good people. We're basically good people who get confused, we lose our way, and sometimes we're just weak, we make mistakes. Now, as long as I like you, I will justify your life like that, and if you disagree with me on things that I think are important, I will shun you as being evil. Paul blows up both of those myths in the very first sentence of Ephesians chapter 2. First of all, notice the word you in that first sentence. And you were dead in trespasses and sins. You were dead. Not other people. You. There's only one category of people in the world. Sinners. Sin is a fatal disease that exists in the heart of every single person. That's why Paul reminds us that you are dead without him. Without Christ, you are dead. That's the second word that challenges how our culture, our society, thinks of itself. The word dead. Our problem is not that we are basically good people who occasionally lose our way, and do bad things. Our problem is that we are completely, spiritually dead. Not asleep, not wayward, we are dead. You know, the moment you pick a flower, the moment you cut a flower, it dies. It dies because it's been separated from its life source. Even though it doesn't appear dead yet, the seeds of death are automatically built into the breaking of fellowship with its source of life, with its vine. When you cut the flower off the tree or off of the vine, fellowship is immediately broken between the, the flower and its source of life. Now, if you take that flower and you hand it to somebody or you put it in a, a, a vase, you have essentially just handed them death. Now, that's not the way it looks most of the time because we don't generally wait several days to hand them a cut flower. We do it pretty quickly. Now, it may be red death. It may be yellow death or pink death or white death. It may be beautiful. It may even be inspiring to some people as they look at it. But give it a little time, and the reality of what circumstance it's in will eventually come to the surface. It will change colors from red to brown. It will change from white to dirty looking and ultimately it will dry out completely because there's no source of life and no matter how much water you put in the vase eventually those flowers will show their true state of existence no matter how hard it tries no matter how hard you try to save it death is inevitable for a cut flower this was the state that we were in 
Isaiah chapter 59 verse 2 says, Your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. We were cut off from our life source because of sin. And there has never been a time in our life when we weren't sinners. And there's never been a time in the history of the world where everybody on the face of the planet was not a sinner except for when Jesus walked the earth. But everybody else fits into one category of sinners. And because we're dead in our sins, no amount of religious behavior or, or, or religious change can fix us. Behavior really only changes the outside. We look pretty like the flowers when we're dead on the inside. They don't deal with the sin problem within us, which means you are not just dead without him, you are enslaved without him. You are held captive without him. You have no hope without him. And you say, well, man, this sermon started awesome. Well, just wait, it gets worse. Paul's still building the argument of why Jesus needed to come and save us. In verses 2 through 3, he begins to unpack for us what this spiritual deadness actually looks like. Verse 2 says uh, that, that we were dead in our trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of our body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just like the rest of mankind. What a, what a terrible indictment on you and I, on everybody that's ever lived. You were followers of Satan. What? That's what he said. You once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air. We were following Satan. The core of Satan's rebellion is I will. According to the book of Isaiah, five times he made this proclamation. I will ascend to heaven. I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of assembly. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself the most high. As, as we follow Satan and his example, we face the I problem. When we joined Satan in his rebellion, we became his sons, his daughters, and his spirit began to shape us and to lead us, the prince of the power of the air. We followed, like the rest of the world, in that spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. That's who we were. We were sons and daughters of disobedience following Satan as he led by example among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. We were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Our, our body, he says they're the desires of the body and of the mind. Our body says have sex with this person or with that person when we know we should not. Eat this or drink that or put this substance into your body when we know we should not. Take it easy. Don't, don't make anybody overwork you don't get so caught up in anything that other people are telling you need to do you do whatever you want to you get angry you don't let those people talk to you that way you be very very eye focused that's what our body tells us to do but our minds say listen you make your own decisions you do things your way those people are not the boss of you that law enforcement is not the boss of you those leaders and teachers and parents, they're not the boss of you. You're the boss of you. You do what you want to. I will ascend to a place of prominence. And because of this, Scripture says we were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Let that sink in for a second. You and I deserve the wrath of God. We really are dead in our sins. Our blasphemy against God deserves the eternal punishment of hell. And Paul starts here because in order to really understand the gospel, to place any value on the gospel, you have to understand what you were saved from or you'll never appreciate what you've been saved for. But because we understand our position before Christ, now we can understand 
our privileges in Christ. Verse 4 contains probably the largest conjunction ever uttered in the history of the world, the most important one. John Stott calls this the greatest two syllables ever spoken in the English language, first written in the Greek language. And here's what it said. With all of that as the backdrop, that's who we are apart from Christ. Verse 4 starts with, but God. All of that's true, but God. Let the force of that hit you for a minute. You were helpless, but God. We were helpless, but we were not hopeless because our hope came from another place. We couldn't have hope in ourselves, but we can have hope in the one who made us. When you were dead in sin, God bared his mighty arm and went to work. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. We were totally dead, but Jesus gives you life. He rescued us from the depth of our depravity, from the enslavement of our sin, from our dead spiritual existence. Jesus saved us. Jesus gives you life. You were dead, but Jesus gives you life. I love watching uh, Planet Earth, any of those kind of documentary series that, that really kind of display nature and everything that's going on in our world. I was on Discovery Channel. It was on BBC uh, America. It's on Netflix now, I believe. I'm not sure if you've seen it, but you should watch it. It is an amazing display of God's gorgeous and amazing creation. Now, of course, that's not the way they frame it on the TV show, but we know better, right? We understand that what we're looking at was created by God. But one day we were watching an episode about jungles, and one particular section dealt with spider monkeys from Madagascar. I love monkeys, and I love spider monkeys, and I love watching uh, about monkeys. And in one particular scene, a baby spider monkey girl decided to climb higher than she'd ever climbed in her entire life. She was trying to get to her mother, who was out gathering food for she and for her siblings, and unfortunately, she made it to a particular place in the tree where the branches got very, very thin, and the baby girl was so high that ultimately those branches would start to give way, and when they started to give way, she lost her grip, and she began to fall, and somehow, because... Monkeys are, you know, a lot more impressive than we are. Somehow, she managed to catch herself on a little bit bigger branch by her tail. But she couldn't save herself. She couldn't reach anything else around her. And every time she tried to reach up to the branch that her tail had a hold of, it began to slump even more. She was clinging on for dear life. She was desperately trying to reach out and grab anything that could save her. The commentator, narrator, went on to say that one out of every three spider monkey babies will not make it to adulthood because they will fall from great heights trying to do something they should never be doing in the first place. And there she was, having done something she should never have done, finding the consequences of her actions leading to her death, hanging on by a thread. And just as her strength began to give out, the daddy spider monkey showed up, grabbed her, and carried her away to safety. You, you want to see a picture of what happened to us? We weren't even clinging onto a branch. We were in a state of free fall. There was no hope at all. There was no branch to grab. And Jesus stepped in and rescued us. By grace, we have been Saved. Luke chapter 19, verse 10. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Jesus Christ gives us life. And Jesus set you free. You were dead, and he gave you life. You were enslaved and captive, and he set you free. Verse 6. And he raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the coming ages... He might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. You, you can summarize, summarize the gospel really in four words. Jesus in my place. 
He lived the life we were supposed to live and then died the death that we were condemned to die. Jesus didn't merely just die for us. He died instead of us. He took our place. And because he took our place in God's eyes, I'm already seated with Christ at the place of honor around God's throne. Raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. I'm not just free. Now I'm family. This is what we've been talking about for a few weeks now. God has adopted us into his family. Listen, slaves can be set free. But that's not all that God did for us. God didn't simply set us free. He adopted us into his family as sons And as daughters, we were sons and daughters of disobedience. We were sons and daughters of wrath. We were sons and daughters of Satan. We were on the enemy team. We were in a foreign traitor race and rebelling against God. And he set us free from that captivity. And he adopted us into his family so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. You will never fully appreciate what God has done for you if you don't realize where he took you from but then when you began to just unwrap everything God has done so that we might be his children it is overwhelming before Christ we were dead and captive but in Christ the privileges that we have we get life and we get freedom and now in Christ you need to understand your possibilities with Christ. Look at verses 8 through 10. For by grace you've been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Not as a result of works, so no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Two things, just two quick thoughts here, and we'll kind of uh, walk through what the implications are for us as individuals and also as families. But here's here's the uh, the implications that we need to really sort of face right now first of all god desires to work in you verses eight and nine you were saved not because you did it it's not because of your works but it's because of what god wants to do in you and then ultimately what god's going to do through you that's the two things that he's reminding us you've been saved through faith by you've been saved by grace through faith Not of your own doing, it's the gift of God. It's not a result of your works. You can't boast about it. We can only boast in Christ. But he did it for a purpose. He he wanted to work in you so that also God can work through you. That's what verse 10 is all about. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You're not saved by works, you're saved for works. What God is doing, you couldn't do without him. You couldn't save yourself, and you certainly can't live for him. The Healing House in Kansas City, Kansas, is a home for drug addicts that was started by a woman named Bobby Joe. Bobby Joe had been walking the streets for many years, but then someone who had experienced the love of God through the gospel of Jesus Christ cared enough to share that same gospel with her. And it radically changed her life. She was born again. She was saved. At the same time, her mother died and left her a significant inheritance. She knew that many of the women who were drug addicts turned to the streets to support their habits. When they were arrested and put in jail, then ultimately released, they didn't have any place to go. So, unfortunately, many of them went back to working the streets. It was the only thing they knew how to do. So with her inheritance, Bobby Joe bought an old retirement home. It was boarded up. It was in pretty bad shape, and she put the money into rehabbing it. She invited the ladies to come in and live there, just as she did. She would share the gospel with them, and then many of them would hear and respond to that. And then the home got completely filled with these ladies that were living on the street. And then a pimp that knew many of them moved into a house next door. I mean, it seemed like a good business opportunity for him. When she started praying for that house, 
she gathered some more resources, and then she bought the house that the pimp lived in. Obviously, she evicted him. It filled up with more women, and she bought another house. And then she bought an apartment complex. This one woman whose life had been racked by sin, but who had been freed from it by the power of the gospel, passed that same good news on to other people who ultimately would be set free as well. At Christmas time, they would take an offering from the ladies who would give out their out of their meager earnings in reputable jobs. They'd buy presents and take them to the homeless on the street that they knew, saying, this is a Christmas gift for you to remind you that there is still hope. There's a Savior who can save you, rescue you from this debauchery, from this disaster. One Christmas Eve, they pulled into a gas station to fill up the house van, and two police officers were standing outside of the gas station. One of the officers walked up to them, and he recognized one of the girls in the van. He walked over to her and said, what are you doing here? I thought you were dead. And then he recognized another woman and another woman, and he kept asking them the same thing. I I thought all of you were dead. He called his partner over and showed them that they were there. Remember, we've talked about it. We haven't seen them. We, We just assumed all of you were dead. But they're not dead. They're alive. And one of the ladies said, well, the truth is, we were dead. We were dead in our sins. But now, we are alive because of a Savior. He has saved us from our death. And He has freed us from captivity. This I know. Every one of us needs to be saved from something. And only Jesus came to save you and can save you. But it's also true that he saved you for something. And see, here's the problem. Here's the disconnect. This is why we're better together. Because Jesus did not save us simply to give us our get-out-of-hell-free card. He did not simply save us so that we'd go to heaven. Jesus saved us so that we could be his workmanship. Look at verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. That word prepared beforehand, that is translated prepared beforehand or predestined, that word in this context is only used one other place in the Bible, referring to, to God's creation in Genesis chapter 1. At creation, God spoke something into nothing. He didn't start with raw materials. He started with nothing. And He created everything. He spoke a light that did not exist into absolute darkness. Here's the thing. According to this verse, when God saved you, He took a righteousness that did not exist, and He spoke it into being in your life. The same powers that spoke the universe into existence began to create righteousness and right living in you. The darkness in your soul is no more able to resist the transforming power of God than the night was able to resist the sunrise. It means that all you have to do in order to Live this life that He has prepared beforehand, before the foundation of the world, that He has called you to. The only thing you have to do is to yield yourself to Jesus and to let Him do it through you. Stop continuously living that charge and challenge of Satan. I will ascend. I will accomplish. I will do as I see fit. Stop doing all of those things that are I-centric and start surrendering to the One who rescued you from that life. He set you free to live for Him. Christianity is not about you doing anything for God. It's about letting Christ do everything through you. Here's the reality. 
While God doesn't need us, He calls us to bring glory to Him and to accomplish His mission on earth. And He puts people in our lives to build us up, to encourage us, to hold us accountable, and He calls us to do the same for them. And He calls us to link arms with other believers that have been saved just like we have, just like Bobby Joe did, with people she passed the gospel on to, and they went out in a force to share that gospel with anybody that would listen. That's what He's called us to do. We are better together. We've been saved into a family. And here's the question, have you? Have you been rescued? You're dead in your trespasses and sins. You're walking that same pathway that everybody else in the world is walking, but God today has shared with you the immense, wonderful, loving, gracious story of His gospel. Why not respond today? Maybe you need to surrender. Maybe you need to follow Jesus today. Maybe you need to be reminded of what he has done and what he will do if you continue to yield to him. Would you bow your heads with me this morning? If you're here listening, watching, you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus, he has done everything to give you life and to set you free. Stop running from it. Start running to Him. Let us know that you want to follow Jesus by using our, our decision card so that we can walk through that journey with you. Or maybe God's telling you, hey, it's time to come back. It's time to rejoin the family of God, to stop doing this from a distance, to stop doing it even though maybe you're here. You're not really here. You come, you sit, you receive but you're not letting Him work through you. Maybe you need to get plugged in. You need to get involved. You need to invest in the lives of other people. God's desire for us is that we would not simply be saved and wait for heaven, but that we would allow Him to rescue us even from a life of mediocrity, even from a life of apathy. And He would set us free and unleash us on the world to take the same gospel that's changed us to the ends of the earth. Father, thank you for each person that is listening to, watching, that's here with this particular message. And, and Lord, we are so grateful that in your word you remind us that as bad as it was, as horrible as we are, you are rich in your mercy and your grace. And you lavish it upon us so that we might be saved so that we might be set free, and so that we might live for you. Father, draw people to you. Continue to do great things. We know you are a great God. For it's in the precious name of your Son, Jesus Christ, that we pray. Amen.